Jeremiah had spent so much time looking at Hope that he had memorised her face, her hair, her hands. This was not her freckle, not her finger. He felt a brief moment of relief, but then felt bad for being, for feeling relieved. Even if none of these fingers were Hope's, they were still human fingers. This had gone beyond a prank. It was a sick game, and it had gone too far. Jeremiah had often said that Parker didn't know when to stop. He was only realising now how true that statement was. And even if it wasn't Hope's finger, it was still Hope's ring. What could that mean? Could Hope be in any kind of danger? Was Parker hurting her? Enough is enough, Parker, Jeremiah yelled. The game has gone on too long. This needs to stop now. Feeling like things are getting out of hand? The voice on a loudspeaker said, laughing. There's only one way that this game ends. Follow the lights before it's too late for your friends. Nice little vibe. <laughs> Jeremiah ran. Before, he didn't want to let Parker see him sweat. But if Hope was truly in danger, he had to get to her. He had wasted too much time already. The lights ended at another empty office, the large one occupied by the boss, when he actually bothered to show up. Jeremiah couldn't even remember when the last time had been. On the large oak desk was a cardboard box with two round holes cut into the lid. A note attached to the box said, For the key to where your friends hide, roll up your sleeves and reach inside. Jeremiah pushed his up his shirt sleeves and plunged his hands through the two holes in the box. Instantly, he was up to his wrists in something cold, wet and squishy. It would be more accurate to say some things that were cold, wet and squishy because the more Jeremiah felt around in the depths of the box, the more he became aware that he wasn't just feeling one slimy mass, but individual items. His hands were tangled up, long, snaky tubes, intestines. Jeremiah hoped that the innards he was feeling had come from some unfortunate livestock and had been acquired at a butcher's shop, but in his mind he knew better. The, <coughs> Sorry. the medical supply company, he told himself. All this stuff came from the medical supply company. It was from people who had died from natural causes, who donated their bodies to scientific research. But even as he tried to convince himself, the words were sounding more and more desperate and ridiculous. If these body parts were for study or dissection, wouldn't they be preserved in some way? All the parts he had encountered during this horrible game seemed disturbingly fresh. Jeremiah feared he might be losing his mind. Was this how you lost the game? By losing your sanity? He fought off wave after wave of nausea to rummage through the awful in search of the key. Finally, his right hand felt something hard and metallic. He grabbed it and withdrew the, his arms from the holes in the box. When he looked at his hands, they were stained red past the wrists. He held up the key. Okay, I've got the key. Is the game over? Do I win now? Because I'm done. Do you hear me, Parker? I'm done. What quest ends with just finding a key, Jeremiah? The voice on the loudspeaker boomed. Don't you have to find out what it's a key to? Don't you want to save your friends, or what's left of them? You're not my friend, Parker, Jeremiah yelled. It felt like something he should have said a long time ago. But Hope was his friend, and she could be in danger or in pain. If she needed saving, he could do it. He took the key and closed the office door behind him, staining the doorknob with a bloody handprint. The trail of lights continued. He followed. The next room had probably been an office at some point, but now it was crammed full of off old office furniture. Sitting on an obviously broken desk chair was another box, wrapped for his birthday, this time with a candy pink bow. It was a medium-sized flat box, the kind that he had always opened last at Christmas as a kid, because he had known it contained clothing, not toys or games. He was pretty sure this box did not contain clothing. He didn't want to open it, didn't want to see what was inside, but if he was going to play the game all the way through on the chance of saving Hope, he had no choice. He tore off the brightly coloured wrapping paper and lifted off the box's cardboard lid. When he saw what was inside, he screamed. He tried to muffle the scream with his fist, but tasted the blood that still covered his hands, oh my god. He looked at the contents of the box, driven by a need to make sense of what he had seen. 
Jeremiah was looking at a face that had been stripped from a human skull along with part of the scalp and hair. It took him a moment longer to realise who the face belonged to. But then he started to put the pieces together, the brown hair with a distinctive forelock, the full lips that had been stretched into a self-satisfied smile. He almost expected the lips to part in a he-he-he. You still think this is Parker? The distorted voice on the loudspeaker said, Oh my god. Oh no. <gasps> oh my god, okay. This is great. Um, do you want to quickly say... A stripped face? That that does sound familiar. It does sound I, I would have expected Jeremiah to uh to have a stripped face, but um you know, we, we move, we move. No, Jeremiah said, surprised to hear the sob in his voice. No, P Parker's right here. He didn't want to, but he found himself looking at again at Parker's peeled away face. Jeremiah wiped tears from his eyes. If Parker wasn't running this sick show, then who was? Jeremiah realised that as long, uh, that as long has he had, oh, there's a spelling mistake, as long as he had thought that Parker was in charge, he could entertain the notion that no matter how bad or cruel things seemed, it was all an elaborate prank. But now it became clear that this was no prank, it was real. There was only one word that made sense to Jeremiah right now, run. He ran, ignoring the trail of lights, ignoring everything except what appeared to be the quickest route out of the building. The halls took on a maze-like quality. To the left, to the right, with no seeming way of escape, he reached the elevator and pushed the button. No light came on. Clearly, whatever psychopath he was dealing with had tampered with the elevator. He ran for the stairwell. He opened the door marked stairs. Jeremiah had always found the dimly lit stairwell creepy, even under much calmer si circumstances, but there was no time to reflect on his feelings now. There was only time to run. As he made his way down the first flight of stairs, he noticed a red smear across the white cinder block wall. Blood. Relatively flesh, fresh blood, judging from its brightness. But whose blood was it? He couldn't slow down to think about it, or the blood that next splattered on the walls would be his. Down, 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 he ran, down fifteen flights of stairs, sweating, panting, his heart pounding like a snare drum. He checked the doors on the way down in hopes of being able to access the elevator from another floor. Locked, locked, locked. Finally, he reached the door marked one, the door that led to the lobby and the exit. He pushed it. It wouldn't budge. He pushed again. It appeared to have been locked from the other side. He pounded on the door with both fists. Help! He yelled, help me, I'm trapped in here. He hoped he could at least get a security guard's attention, but there was no one there to hear him. He pounded and yelled a few more minutes just in case, but it was no use. He wiped tears of frustration from his eyes. Now what? There was no place to go but back up. Jeremiah was beyond winded. Going up the stairs was much more tiring than going down. He stopped on the landing of the sixth floor to catch his breath and saw something he hadn't noticed on his way down. The sixth floor door was outlined in a string of tiny lights, the same kind that had lit his way throughout the horrendous birthday game. He pushed on the door. It opened. Jeremiah went inside the sixth floor, an office space that had been vacant since he had taken a job with a game company. He knew going inside was probably a bad idea. No, it was definitely a bad idea. But what other choice did he have? He could go back up to his office, which was littered with viscera, and ruled by a malevolent presence on the loudspeaker, or he could take his chances here. The only illumination on the sixth floor came from the strings of tiny lights hung above the ceiling. There were no computers, no office furniture, no other signs of human activity. There were only the tiny lights leading down a dark hallway. At the end of the hallway was some kind of faint glow, almost as if he had been hypnotized to do so. Jeremiah followed the lights. He was going to see this thing through. The glow was coming from a room at the end of the hall. As he drew nearer, the source of the glow became obvious. An old TV, the kind he could remember from his grandmother's house, was sitting in an empty room. It was turned on, but the screen showed only the black and white pattern his grandmother had always referred to as snow. On the shelf below the TV was an equally ancient piece of audiovisual equipment, a VCR. 
Jeremiah hadn't seen one of those since his childhood. The green power button on the VCR glowed in a reassuringly familiar way. On a whim, Jeremiah pressed play. The snow on the screen disappeared and was replaced by the smiling faces of Parker and Hope. Surprise, Hope said, laughing in her soft, tinkly way. Gotcha, Parker said. Got you good this time. Oh, and he looked over at Hope. Happy birthday, the two of them yelled together. I hope you appreciate all our efforts, Jeremiah, Hope said. It was a lot of work putting all this together, even though it was totally worth it. I never thought we'd get it put together in time, Parker said, between setting up the motion sensors and the loudspeaker. But it couldn't have gone better, could it? Hope said, flashing her familiar, sweet-looking smile. Jeremiah didn't recognise the room in which Hope and Parker had been filmed. It was too dark to make out much of the setting. However, he could discern what was on the table at which they stood. The kind of sharp kitchen scissors used for boning meat, a variety of knives ranging in size from a small scalpel to a huge cleaver. It was perfect, Parker said to Hope. Then he turned to face the camera. But now that you've had your birthday surprise, there's a good chance that Hope and I need to get a hospital. To a hospital. He grinned like a game show host. I bet we do, Hope said, laughing. The smile faded from Parker's face. Okay, Parker, he yelled into the camera. He's ready. Give us a knock. Knock, knock. At first, Jeremiah thought the knocking was coming from the videotape, but then he realised the source of the noise was a supply closet a few feet away from him. Someone, something, was knocking very low on the closet door from the inside. Without even thinking about it, Jeremiah started backing out of the room, though his gaze was still fixed on the TV screen. Now if you'll excuse us, the Parker on the video said, Hope and I have some work to do. Parker leaned over toward the camera. He was holding a big pair of pliers, which he opened and closed menacingly, then let out his trademark, he he he. The screen went black. Oh my god, what? Jeremiah stood, frozen in confusion and terror, as the supply closet door slowly inched open. What? Wait, what? That's the ending? Okay. I, I'm, I, hmm, eh, I'm not sure about this, I'm not, I'm not sure. <laughs> See, I don't know what to say, um, I'm not feeling this one. I was really, really excited when, um, I was really excited when I found out that it was a, a, like a VR kind of um, a VR game kind of story again, because then it would have connections to FNAF VR, obviously, and we need we need more of those. And we saw the um, the the face that was cut off, um, the sliced face, uh, and I actually started to really get into this. But then that ending just doesn't do it for me. At all. It, it doesn't feel satisfying at all. Um, I get it. I get it's a kind of creepy ending. And uh, it's, I assume, I assume the worst for Jeremiah here. But I don't, I don't get it. It's, it's a lot of setup for nothing, right? Because you've got the whole, like, plot of Jeremiah liking Hope and Parker, um, being like a like a cool guy and then that doesn't really go anywhere so what was the point of it i don't know may maybe i was expecting a lot and then got disappointed because i had high expectations but um it started out well i will say that i was really into it and then this ending just doesn't really make sense to me i it doesn't fit Right? And it's all, it seems kind of rushed. Right? Does anybody else feel that? Does anybody else feel it's kind of rushed? It's also a very short story. Um, 
what I've just read is about 20% of the book. Um, yeah, I, I'm, I'm not a fan. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. <laughs> if you guys enjoyed it, then make sure you tell me in the comments below. Uh, if you didn't enjoy it, then also tell me, because I want people to share my opinion. But um, maybe it's just me. Maybe there was something extravagant there that I completely missed, because, you know, I am recording an audiobook, so I'd probably be miss a lot of details. But um, thank you guys so much for watching. Next time we are going to be reading Kids at Play, which I is the one I'm most excited for, because... Um, apparently it's about someone leaving home or something, uh, and then there's, like, a whole gardening aspect. Wait, no, is that the same? I don't even know if that's... No, the gardening thing is in Felix the Shark, never mind. Um, anyway, yeah, I'm excited for this one, so I'll, I'll upload that as soon as possible. Anyway, I will see you later, goodbye. <laughs>